Well, thank you very much. I, I uh, thought I agreed never to follow John Kufos. Uh, it's uh, incredible, but what he's achieved. Well, I want to take you back a uh, hundred years ago into 1920. That's when W.H. Abrams arrived in Mitchell County in West Texas. He found what appeared to be nothing but barren desert, land totally devoid of water and vegetation. He would go on to produce the first 10 barrels of oil in the Permian Basin, unlocking the vast potential to power humanity hidden beneath the ground. Now, similarly, it's easy to look at our prisons and see nothing but a wasteland devoid of potential, a sea of nameless orange jumpsuits marked by just TDCJ ID numbers, broken souls who will not just be rightly held to account for what they did on the worst day of their life, but forever defined by it. However, just like the Permian Basin in 1920, we know there is so much hidden potential. As in the, as in the energy industry, tapping that potential takes a lot of hard work and teamwork, which is the creed of the project Safe Streets and Second Chances that John has led so brilliantly. Now, there is one difference though between tapping an oil field and the talents of people behind bars. Now, we all know there's been remarkable advances in fracking. We can get oil out that we never thought we could before, but there's still a limit. Eventually, you exhaust it. However, the reservoir of human potential inside all of us, including in those coming out of prison, is truly infinite. My good friend Craig DeRoche of Prison Fellowship said, God never made a throwaway person. But you know, some would say this is just the wrong time to be tackling the issue of giving second chances uh, when hiring in the energy industry. We all know there's a pandemic, there's a lot of restrictions. Um, there's $35 barrel in oil. It's pretty hard to uh, even make a profit taking oil from the ground. And there's social distancing guidelines that make reentry difficult. How do you do the one-on-one -on -one meetings with someone coming out of prison in this time? But you know, one of the great authors, Mark Twain said, there's never a wrong time to do the right thing. And I believe it's that belief in each of you that brings you to this conversation today. You know, I would tell you the, the saying that there's never a wrong time to do the right thing also defines the history of criminal justice reform here in Texas and what we've done. You know, I was brought on 15 years ago in 2005 by our then president, Brooke Rollins, and people, she said, people told her she was bonkers. Why would you with a think tank of five people tackle criminal justice reform, which wasn't seen as a conservative issue? Well, it turns out it was, that we could save money and save lives. Now, we had the same challenge in 2007. Some of you who recall uh, will know that in, in January 2007, our legislative budget board said Texas would need to build 17,000 more prison beds over five years, a cost of two or $3 billion. And you know, we had always just done one thing. When they said we needed to build more prison beds, we built them. We went from 30,000 in the mid 80s to then at the time of 2007, almost 160,000 prison beds. But something happened in 2007. We decided it was the right time to do something different. We decided we could expand drug courts. We could expand treatment options so that people could be safely supervised in the community. Now, of course, some of you may remember the goal was simply to not have to build more prisons but we actually well overshot the goal. We've closed 10 prisons, we've idled another one this year, but perhaps most importantly, our crime rate since 2007 is down 40%. Our incarceration rate is down 35%. So let me tell you a little bit about how that happened. First of all, we funded probation and drug courts. Uh, we had swift and certain sanctions for people when they violated their probation instead of automatically sending them back to prison. Now on the parole side, we also made a huge difference. And I will tell you, we had 1300 fewer new offenses by parolees because we did things like instant drug testing. We did things like restoring parole chaplains who connect parolees with churches and synagogues uh, when they, instead of going back into a gang, it makes a real difference. Now, we're, let me tell you, we didn't stop there. Let me tell you about some of the bills we passed in the last several years. One of them is saying employers and landlords can't be sued simply for giving someone a second chance. That just by virtue of hiring someone or renting to someone who has a criminal record, you cannot be sued for negligence. Record sealing. We've expanded the law so people with a single nonviolent misdemeanor can get that record sealed. Occupational licensing reform. My colleague Derek Cohen did a, almost a single-handed brilliant job in the last session getting legislation done that says, if you have a prior offense that's not related to the occupation, after you've done your time, you can punch the clock. 
And then let me also tell you about our bonding program, which is a federal program, and we just highlighted how Louisiana is using it as well. But many businesses don't even know this. You can get a bond that secures someone. If you're worried about someone with a record stealing from your business, whether through the Texas Workforce Commission or the agency in your state, you can get a bond to cover that. One of the other bills we had last session, uh, we're gonna have everyone leaving prison now have a resume. We're gonna align the job training in prison to available jobs of the workforce. And we're gonna have mock interviews, mock job interviews for folks leaving prison. By the way, a lot of these policies have been adopted by the American Legislative Exchange Council. You can go to their website and find them and take those models to your states around the country. Well, let me conclude by saying there's a unifying theme across energy, across entrepreneurship and across reentry. And what is that? It's that we have to take on risk while seeking to mitigate it. We have to learn from our mistakes. You know, when wildcatters in Texas encountered a dry hole, they didn't give up. They made a better plan, found the next best place to drill. You know, there's a risk whenever someone's released from prison. But when we provide support, both economic and spiritual sustenance, we reduce the risk of that failure. We reward persistence. My colleagues, John Kufos and Alice Marie Johnson, who of course couldn't be here today, they epitomize what it means to never give up. It was Winston Churchill who said, success is not final, failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. Thanks to each of you for having that courage, because it's that courage that will propel people from prison to, pay, prison to paycheck. It will also uplift the energy industry and uplift the American spirit. Thank you.